Hello and welcome. I'm Adjunct Associate Professor Paula Bray, the Director of Research at the Sydney Children's Hospitals Network, and welcome to our Advanced Therapeutics webinar series where we focus on the rapidly evolving space of advanced therapeutics as it prevents, presents innovative and potentially transformation treatments for children now and into the future. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all today. And before we get started, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we're all meeting today. This webinar is being hosted from the traditional lands of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation in the east of Sydney and the Barramatical people of the Darug Nation in the west of Sydney. We pay our respects to elders past and present and acknowledge the community members, Aboriginal staff, services and organisations who work closely with us to improve the health and well-being of children and young people, their families and communities. So today we are joined by a panel of experts from Phage Australia who will be speaking about their unique STAMP trial, which focuses on evaluating the clinical protocol for administering and monitoring phage therapy. We will also hear from our very own local experts who will outline everything we need to know about the practicalities of carrying out phage therapy protocols. Following the presentations, our panel will open for discussion, so please do submit any questions that you have via the webinar Q&A tab in the Zoom controls. And if you see a question submitted that you'd really like to have answered, you can upvote the question by clicking the thumbs up beside it. Now, I would, it's my absolute pleasure to hand over to Professor John Idell, who is the Director of um, the Centre for Infectious Diseases and Microbiology at the Westmead Institute for Medical Research and a Senior Staff Specialist um, in Infectious Diseases and Microbiology at Westmead Hospital. Over to you, John. Thanks, Paula. I'm just having a little trouble with sharing my video, which won't start. Perhaps I'll just go straight to sharing screen. And we're talking today about bacteriophage therapy. So this is the concept of using the natural predators of bacteria, which are found wherever bacteria are found, to treat bacterial infection. So it's a simple enough concept. Most viruses on Earth are directed towards bacteria, not towards humans, even though they're the ones we think about. Um, to use bacteriophages, the natural predators of bacteria, as a treatment is what we're really here to talk about. And we've gathered together as a group of people. Um, and I cannot advance my screen either. I'm sorry, I can't advance the screen, but look, we gathered, we've gathered as a group of people around the country representing the big metropolitan hospitals um, in the city and many hospitals in the country in most of our states and territories, all the children's hospitals and many of the adult hospitals and many of the major universities in order to agree on the best ways to use bacteriophage therapy and to set up approaches to do it. And I'm going to hand over to Amine and Stephanie now to take you through these. So Amine and Stephanie. Thank you very, uh, very much, John. Um, okay, so Stephanie and I are going to discuss a little bit about the um, practical aspects of uh, using phage therapy in Australia um, under what we call the STAMP protocol. So STAMP stands for Standardized Treatment and Monitoring of Phage Therapy. We have national ethics approval to, um, to do this in pretty much um, any hospital in Australia, and it's approved for use in both adults and children. The sponsor is um, Western Sydney LHD. It's, reg it's a registered trial and has been endorsed by adult and, infec and pediatric infectious disease specialist groups. It's an open label single arm trial, so there is no comparator, and it's overseen by a independent uh, data and safety monitoring board. It's a protocol to look at a standardized way of administering and monitoring phage therapy. So in effect, there's no investigational product that we're um, testing per se. 
The aims are to firstly, obviously, standardize the process, um, both for in terms of managing patients and collecting the data. Um, but the primary objective of the trial is to assess both short and long term safety, as well as feasibility, although we do have a range of other exploratory outcomes that we're looking at as well. What isn't STAMP? Um, so this is one of the main questions that we often get asked. The, the initial referral to discuss a patient um, for phage therapy is a clinical one. And the same rules apply as you would uh, if you were doing a clinical consult to another specialist for, it, for any reason for a patient. One of the things that we look, well, the main things that we look for in that referral is to ensure that we have a confirmed bacterial pathogen and one that's linked to the infectious syndrome that the patient is experiencing. And ideally, an, an infection which is not polymicrobial. So that is the first step, and that's a clinical consult, as, as I said, with a phage therapy clinician. The second thing, which is not part of the trial, is the selection and sourcing of the phage product. And there are three things that we look at. One is that it's a good um, product, and Stephanie is going to outline some of the lab parameters that we look at to ensure that it's, um, it's an effective or very lytic um, uh, phage, that it's a safe product. And again, Stephanie will outline some of the things that we uh, look at in terms of the formulation that we might want to use for a patient, and that it meets all the regulatory requirements for an unregistered product being used in Australia. So as Amino mentioned, um, once a potential uh, patient has been identified for phage therapy, this would prompt the clinician to send a bacterial isolate causing the infection to a phage lab for phage susceptibility. So I will preface that in majority of the cases at the moment, uh, the bacterial isolates are sent to the Iredell lab as we have a large collection of phages, um, but it wouldn't be uncommon um, to send it to a national or international lab that have different collections of phages. So I will just speak on my experience of phage susceptibility testing and production in the um, Iredell lab. So to begin um, phage susceptibility testing, as I mentioned, the uh, pure isolate of the bacterial isolate is sent to the lab and stocked. And then we perform phage susceptibility testing, starting with a phage spot assay. So basically this involves growing the patient isolate on an agar plate and then spotting small volumes of the phage on top with each uh, unique, sorry, with each grid square here um, representing a unique phage tested. We then get um, the results of the phage spot testing. And this is really a baseline test to see um, if we have any potential hits um, and where we can go from there. So here um, represents uh, results from two different patient isolates, but the exact same phage is tested on both. So for the patient on the left here, we would probably go back to the clinical team and say, we do have uh, many potential hits and we can uh, begin to rank these hits, but depending on how well they lies the patient isolate. But for the patient on the uh, right, we would probably go back to the clinical team and say, unfortunately, from our lab collection, we don't have any potential hits. Um, and that would prompt them to decide whether we should send this isolate to another lab um, to test their collection or to seize the option of phage therapy. So with this information, we give that back to the clinical team, as I mentioned, and Amina is going to talk more on um, the de decisions that come from this. So once we know that we have a potentially suitable phage for, for, for use, um, and whether that result comes from, as I said, John's lab next door or from an overseas supplier, um, we go through the process of ensuring that the patient can be enrolled into the trial. So the inclusion criteria are some of the things that we've already um, looked at, considered before. So you've got a confirmed bacterial infection. We then want to ensure that standard therapies and source control has already been optimized before we embark on investigational treatment. And so this requires um, a review by specialists, um, the local team um, in the site or through us, if it's at, at our hospital, infectious disease specialists, ensuring that the, the antibiotics, the source control surgery has all been optimized. We then have to ensure that a suitable phage product is identified, and so we would have had that information by then, that meets with the regulatory requirements. And for the stamp protocol, the bare minimum is a notification or approval through the TGA's special access scheme, but there are a range of other approvals that may be required depending on the phage and where it's coming from. So occasionally we need some, we need local drug committee approvals uh, or from a hospital executive. Uh, if it's coming from overseas, uh, usually a 
BICON permit is required to import through the uh, Department of Agriculture. Again, depending on who the supplier is, they may request a material transfer agreement. And if the farge that's going to be used is a genetically modified one, then additional licensing from the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator may also be required. For a site to become a recruitment site for STAMP, it's pretty basic. So any hospital, public or private in Australia can, can recruit. Um, we need a, to identify an, a, a suitable PI for the site. Um, and that should be someone either with experience in phase therapy or an in infection management. So often it's an infectious disease or clinical microbiologist. Um, the HREC approval process is relatively straightforward because it has gone through the National Mutual Agreement for um, Ethics Approval across Australia. We generally only need to provide a PICV um, to, to add on a new site, but then we need to go through the process of local governance approval or uh, site specific approvals and, um, and those can be variable depending on the site, but we can uh, work with sites to help them uh, obtain those approvals. So once we on the lab, lab side get the green light that there is a potential patient and they have all their appropriate um, site approvals, uh, we then perform, perform um, further phage diagnostics, um, purification and formulation. So from the spot test, there is generally um, quite a few phage hits and options that we could work through. And so we choose two diagnostic tests to kind of narrow down um, the phage options. So I won't be able to go through these in too much detail, but um, one is called the efficiency of plating. And this is basically how efficient a phage is on a given uh, bacterial isolate, sorry, patient bacterial isolate in comparison to its natural host. Um, and this is a on a solid medium. Whereas we also have a phage kinetic assay. And um, this is basically looking at how well the phage can inhibit the bacterial isolate growth over an 18 hour period in a liquid medium. So we use both of these tests in conjunction um, to identify the most suitable phage or phage cocktail um, for a patient isolate. The selected phage or phages um, then move on to what is called purification. And this is predominantly done by Ali Khalid and um, Jessica Thatcher. So this is very labor intensive. So uh, only the, the correct phages and um, ones that are ready for patients are chosen. And the basic, uh, I guess the overall aim for purification is to remove the endotoxins um, that remain from the way that we produce our phages. The end product from purification or the purified product then goes through a QAQC product, um, sorry, QAQC. QAQC um, process, where we then test the potency, the pH, uh, the endotoxin levels, sterility, and metagenomics. Um, any product or all products that, um, I guess, pass this process are then um, diluted to the appropriate dose and formulated into individual vials, where each individual vial is a dose. The phages are then sent over to the hospital. Um, this is just an example where uh, each box has the appropriate amount of doses for a treatment period. We also send over um, pre-coded collection packs just for ease of sample collection um, at the bedside. And Amin is gonna talk a little bit more about these samples that are collected throughout treatment in a moment. And we also send over um, four documents. So these are both um, phage and the production host <clears throat> safety um, from genomics. Uh, by our bioinformatician, sorry, bioinformatician Nuri. Uh, we also send over the phage susceptibility report, so how we actually chose the phages that we did for treatment, as well as the phage batch report that has all the QAQC results. So this is just a brief timeline from, I guess, identifying a potential patient to having phages ready. Um, so this is the kind of timeline that you may expect, but as you'll see, some of these are, some of these steps are variable in time. So um, but either way, this process leads to phages that are pure and safe, ready for administration and monitoring. So I'll hand back to Amina to talk about the monitoring side. So yeah, once you've recruited your participant um, and they've signed the consent form, um, and you're embarking on treatment, this is a, a rough table. Well, it's an approximate table of the kinds of monitoring that's done as part of the protocol. I haven't included all of the details, obviously. Um, it includes, and, and, and this is uh, 
the, the standard two week treatment course. We do have some patients that get slightly shorter or maybe longer courses of treatment, but the standard would be about two weeks of treatment. And this requires a number of blood tests. Um, on some days we do up to three blood tests a day and that's because we try and monitor the kinetics of how the, the phages and the bacteria are behaving. Um, but generally one blood test on most days. Um, we also do a quality of life survey, which is done at baseline and then at follow up uh, at the end of treatment um, and three and six months beyond uh, treatment completion. I put ticks for safety at those follow up points, but the reality is we're monitoring for safety all the way through, but we do have two time points um, that we are reporting safety indicators. So one is the short term safety at two weeks after completion of treatment, and then long term safety six months after completion of treatment. Clinical outcome, which is primarily um, signs symptoms as well as uh, the microbiology is assessed two weeks at the end of treatment. Um, so that's a run through of the trial. Um, I'm going to hand over to Tony Lai to speak a little bit about the pharmacy. Thanks, I'm an Steffi. I'll just share my screen. Okay. Um, so I'll spend the next five-ish minutes talking about uh, the pharmacist involvement uh, with fire treatment and stamp protocol. Um, firstly, I've just described my personal clinical experience. So, so far I've been involved with four patients, three girls and a boy, uh, who ha we have given uh, fire uh, to. Two of them were, were nasty pseudomonal infections and the other two were uh, mycobacterial abscesses respiratory tract infections. Uh, we've given them in, the, in a range of, of routes, uh, mainly intravenous as being um, the, main, the main route of administration, but also endobronchially uh, and uh, topically through a, a nasal sinus rinse. And um, uh, what we Kylie or, or, and Rachel will talk about later is that uh, we've also been involved in, in administering these these phages in the Heath setting. Now, um, this is probably the most important slide of my talk, and the frequently asked question I get from almost every single pharmacist who has been involved in the stamp study uh, investigator sites, and it's basically highlighting the main differences. Um, uh, if we're using a GMO or non-GMO phage. Um, and um, really the, the, the GMO phages require a, a higher level of um, uh, management from how it's made up, how it's stored, how it's delivered, how um, you manage it when there's a spill. So uh, here's a, is a summary slide of it all, but um, basically uh, th there are main differences in uh, the, the PPE of required for nurses to administer it and, and in a PC2 lab um, required where a, a pharmacist with a septic training needs to be involved in, in, uh, in compounding it for clinical use. So, Pharmacists are involved at many levels of, of the FARS treatment and the decision to engage um, in the FARS trial. And they're, they're essential team members in determining site readiness, policies, education, the, the logistics, if it's GMO or non-GMO, and, and being involved in education, training um, pharmacists and, and nursing staff, and increasing awareness of the requirements involved. So if I were to summarize, four main skill sets that uh, a pharmacist uh, who is involved in phages is clinical trials management. So being involved in the individual patient use paperwork for drug committee, the SAS forms and, and the BICON permits that, that um, has, has briefly mentioned, which is only in, in, um, in relevance to overseas GMO imported products. Um, so clinical trials management, aseptic preparation, especially if it's a GMO, governance and, and education. <clears throat> so um, we have um, imported phages from, from the University of Pittsburgh um, and had them um, 
locally delivered from from um, John's lab in Westmead. But um, as an investigator, so one's, one needs to be mindful of the cost implications of, of, of such items. Um, they can be cold chain items um, and incur a, quite a significant cost. And then when we get to the pointy end of, of using the phages, how do we prescribe it? So pharmacists should be involved in ensuring the clinical applica applications allow for the documentation of phage therapy, how it's charted, the routes of administration, having it in iPharmacy and, and, and HPPL as an item to, to label up and dispense. And um, I will now hand it over to Rachel and Kylie. Thank you, Tony. Kylie and I are excited to um, present to you today the practical nursing perspectives with hospital and home. Just share our screen. So the Sydney Children's Hospital Network, Hospital in the Home, fondly referred to as HITH, plays an important role in providing an opportunity for children and families to be treated in the comfort of their own home with the benefits of maintaining quality of life despite undergoing hospital treatment. In HITH, we have successfully demonstrated that administering phage therapy in the community is safe with our HITH team administering phage in both the home and school environments for three children to date. It is important to highlight that these three children were all treated specifically with intravenous GMO phage for around a period of six to 12 months. And our practical nursing perspectives will be specific and relevant to our experiences with the administration of intravenous GMO phage in the community. Thank you, Rach. Now let's look into the practical nursing perspectives of how HIF gave the IV GMO phage safely in the community. Firstly, how did HIF store and transport the phage into the community? HIF was able to transport the pre-made GMO phage syringes provided to us by pharmacy within a labelled puncture-proof container placed within a larger SD with an ice brick for transportation. On arrival to the home or school visit, the HIF nurses were required to follow strict PPE requirements according to the biosafety recommendations for GMOs, which involved the HIF nurses donning a long sleeve gown, gloves, protective eyewear, enclosed footwear and long hair tied back during the setup and administration of GMO phage. Once the PPE was donned, the HIF nurses would attend their routine set of observations, including a blood pressure, temperature, heart rate and respiratory rate, and a general wellness assessment, along with CVAD monitoring, to ensure the patient remained well enough for the day's phage administration. Post-patient observations and patient monitoring were performed as indicated by the treating team. In the setup of the GMO phage in the home, HIF nurses again followed the biosafety recommendation for GMOs, with a more recently recommended use of a closed system. HIF recently used a system called EquiShield. The phage was easily administered via an IV bolus over five minutes. However, it's important to note that phage can be given via other routes, but in HIF's experiences, we did give it over the IV slow bolus over five minutes. Now, looking into the, the disposal of waste, we've um, had a biohazard spill kit, kit that was kept in the home and also at school. Um, in case of a spill, very unlikely using a closed system, but it was there just in case. At the end of our home visit, the HIF nurse would place all the used equipment and doff their PPE into hazardous clinically waste um, bags, so double bagged, and we brought those bags back to the hospital to be placed in the hazardous waste bins to be incinerated. Um, now I'll hand back to you, Paula.
Well, thanks everyone for some really wonderful presentations and I'm sure um, you've all got lots um, of fantastic information to share with us. So I just really like to extend my thanks for, for those mm -hmm. presentations. And I'd also like to introduce Dr. Laura Fawcett, who is a respiratory consultant and advanced therapeutics medical lead at Sydney Children's Hospital um, at Randwick and Dr. Michelle Lorenz Hoss, who is a pediatric neurologist for the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Um, they are very um, kindly going to take us through a facilitated question and answer session now. Um, so I will hand over um, to Laura and Michelle. Thanks, Paula. Um, we've got one question in the Q&A, so we encourage people to, to add some more there, but we might start off with just um, a more general question. Um, maybe to Amine, um, to start with, can you describe the most ideal Farge therapy patient? What's the, the most ideal scenario from a clinician's point of view for, for Farge therapy? Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Laura. Um, so the ideal patient is essentially where you have a single pathogen um, and ideally an organism where we know we have lots of potential phages. So in, um, in our lab or John's lab next door, we have a lot of phages for um, some gram-negative infections, so things like E. coli, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella. Um, so in that group or family of a uh, big group of, of bacteria, we have a lot of good phages that we could use. Um, some species not as many hits. Um, so we have treated some patients for mycobacterial disease, but uh, it depends on the organism and where the supply of phages are. The second thing that we look at is, as I said, a single organism. So mixed infections um, are not great um, because you treat the the single organism you can hit, but you're still left with everything else that's, that's still contributing. And where we know that, that the infection is the only problem or if you fix the infection you kind of fix the problem the, the a lot of referrals we get are people who are very sick and very unwell where infection is one of many problems they have and although we can help that infection we can't help some of the other things like the surgical underlying issues and so which might be contributing to the inflammatory experience of the patient and and so then it becomes really difficult to sort of think you know is our treatment actually going to change how the, the patient's being managed or how they're going to feel? So the ideal patient, like I said, is they've got just one infection and it's a single organism and it's preferably a, a nice uh, gram negative. Um, the kinds of things that we get uh, referred to are either because the infection's complicated, um, so it's a site that's difficult for antibiotics to treat, so um, maybe prosthetics involved, and so therefore your standard therapies, antimicrobial, you know, antibiotics aren't as good, um, or they're really highly drug resistant, and so the antibiotics either have very limited antibiotic choices, or what you have is so toxic that the patient can't really tolerate it. Um, so in those situations, we would say, yeah, phage therapy is a good idea, let's explore it. Okay, Thanks thank you. I might ask a question to John now. So John, we have a question from the Q&A. How do you estimate the dose or the amount of phage? So for a particular infection in a given patient, is it waste-based or does the type of infection, so for example, will infective endocarditis require a different course or dose to an abscess, for instance? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it's not entirely clear at the moment what the best dose is, nor how to define it for an individual. The dose that a lot of people around the world, including us, have settled on is based on an assumed ratio between the number of phages in the blood and the number of bacteria in the blood that you would have if you were really sick. And so we, by simple calculations, derive the dose that we currently use, which uh, if anybody's interested enough is uh, 10 to the 9, so that's a 1,000 million viruses per, per dose. Um, and that means that if you're in terrible septic shock, you would have your bacteria in your blood outnumbered by viruses, something like 10 to 1 or even more. And we think from animal models that that's probably the right kind of dose. We actually have looked at this. When we monitor it, we can see that mostly that is all used up by the time we go to redo, so it's probably about right. Great. Thanks, John. Um, we've got another question in the chat that I think um, 
think we should direct this to Steph, to Stephanie um, from Brandon Sharp. And I'm going to test my science knowledge here for PST. I think that's the point, the point spot test or spot point test. Um, for the PST test, is there any procedure in practice to quantify the spots? Yeah, that's a really great question. Is it okay if I share my screen for this for a bit of a visual aid as well? 100%. <laughs> Thank you. So just taking it back to the spot test, um, hopefully you can... Oh. Sorry. Sorry, if I just compare um, the spot tests on this one. So um, it's a really good point that is there a way to quantify this because it is quite subjective ranking, I guess, how well a farge or a farge spot lies is based on just I. Um, there is a bit of work to uh, use AI to, I know, quantify the spots, which is why we use um, more of those, I guess, quantitative measures afterwards, which is the EOP, which is directly quantifying the um, phage lysis or the titer on the strains, um, and then obviously a quantify, uh, quantification of um, the growth in liquid. So I think your question was in terms of the spot test, is there a way to quantify that? But um, I will admit that it, at the moment it is quite subjective because it depends on who looks at it. Is this one clearer than this one? Like what, what would you rank it? So that's why we use these uh, quantification methods. So I hope that answers your question, but I'm happy for any follow-up. If that didn't answer the question. Thank you. So actually, I'll direct this question to Tony. So Tony um, and uh, others may also I want to contribute, but what's the regulatory system in Australia to ensure the quality of lab prepared phage? So is it is it looked at in the same way as medicines such as the TGA, um, or is there a different type of quality process? I think this is the regulatory system for phages is continually an evolving process. Uh, um, I think John's probably the best person to ask, but um, he, he's been involved with this at the forefront um, at, at the regulatory level in the TGA. But um, it's my understanding is it's it's still evolving. Is that yeah, right? that, that's exactly right, Tony. Yeah. I think it is likely that it will be regulated at a, as a medicine or something like that. It is also likely that the TGA will um, develop a new regulatory framework and, and we'd be lucky enough to be part of a conversation, Armin and I, part of a regular conversation with the TGA about how this will look. So no one in the world has a regulatory framework defined for phage therapy. There are two countries that it's allowed as part of routine practice, but in all of the rest of the Northern Hemisphere, it's seen as an experimental drug as it is here, which means that if you want to use it, you essentially have to use it in the same way that, or justify it in the same way as you would justify any other regulated therapy. So we use the, the special access scheme of the TGA at the moment, and we've tried to, as Amine and Steph have outlined, introduce a standardised monitoring protocol so that when it is used, we can best understand um, the safety and kinetics of the drugs as we use them. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. I'm going to combine a couple of questions here about some adverse reactions and start by asking um, Rachel and Kylie about, from a nursing perspective, how did the patient respond to the treatment? What types of reactions did you have to look out for? And kind of what was the monitoring period around the infusion time? Thanks, Laura. Um, look, some of the reactions that we did have to look out for were fever and general anaphylaxis. Um, the monitoring period did vary between team to team. Um, we did observations as we entered the home and then sometimes we did observations 30 minutes after the phage was administered and they were just a general temperature, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, respiratory rate again. Um, and that was just in general, just to make sure that there was no kind of adverse effect of administering the phage to the patient. Thanks, Rachel. Amna and John, do you want to comment on any other adverse reactions or adverse responses that need to be monitored for in patients? Sure. Um, so there are things that we look for. We don't often see them. So in the great majority of patients, nothing happens. <laughs> we give them the phage and they you know, they go through the treatment. It would be similar to getting an IV antibiotic. They don't actually experience much. 
Occasionally, we do see an inflammatory response um, to the treatment. And this inflammatory response is usually triggered by the phages doing what they're meant to do. So they go to their bacterial targets, they kill them, that lysis or that sort of breakup ends up releasing a whole bunch of bacterial debris into the bloodstream, which the immune system responds to. Um, we see it predominantly with those patients who are being treated for gram-negative infections as opposed to, you know, the mycobacterial infections. And it depends on the infectious syndrome, whether it's a very chronic, low-grade grumbling infection versus a, a much more acute infection. Um, so that's what we look for. We do look for, obviously, reactions to the phage formulation. And then, um, I think there was also a question about endotoxins that Stephanie had mentioned as well. So I can kind of touch on that briefly. So endotoxins are essentially um, elements, uh, including things like LPS on the, on the cell wall of bacteria, which stimulate an immune response. When Because phages are grown in a bacterial host, when we make the phages, you get a bit of contamination from the the, the pure, you know, the, the manufacturing process. The purification gets rid of most of that, but a little bit does residually remain in the formulation. And part of the QC is to ensure that that endotoxin level is below what we consider a threshold. And that's threshold set out by the FDA in, in the US um, as what we call the pyrogenic threshold. So there's a threshold above which we know most people would experience a fever and feel a bit unwell. And so if we can make sure that our formulations are below that limit, then most patients, they might experience a bit of a fever, but they probably won't really experience much. And so we try and get rid of any endotoxin. There might be some still left in the formulation. And so therefore the patient might experience a reaction from the endotoxins that we administer. But generally we don't expect that. We, we monitor for it, but we don't expect it. Because as I said, we would only give something that we knew was safe to give because it was below that pyrogenic threshold. And I think it's fair to say, isn't it, Amine, that of the nearly 30 patients we've treated who have not actually observed this phenomenon, um, we did, um, in a patient that you treated and subsequently published, show pretty clearly that this was what you referred to before, this idea of breaking open all the bacteria and causing an inflammatory response to that. And this is well known in infectious diseases of other types of, other types of treatments. Thank you. So another question from the audience. Um, this started with a um, mention of great presentations and thank you. Um, but then I'm always surprised that there isn't more of an immune response against IV administration. So have you looked for production of antibodies against phage during the course of treatment? Do very long courses of treatment run into a problem of neutralizing antibodies? Do you want to take that, John? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so so well, there's two components to the question. Firstly, to make the point that these are naturally occurring viruses, and if we meet these bacteria, we meet these bacterial viruses. So we're all exposed to all the time. Um, but obviously, when we're infusing them, we're giving quite a lot of them and giving them in fairly concentrated doses for a concentrated period of time. And we do consistently see antibodies rise Typically, I think, um, Armani, about the seven to 10 day mark, don't we? And yes, they do seem to many, in many circumstances, have a neutralizing effect. Whether that has a significant impact on clinical efficacy is at the moment uncertain. Um, I'm not sure that we're quite settled on the answer to that question, but we do see neutralizing antibodies. And that's one of the reasons why we think a lot of the bank for the buck is in that first week or two. Thanks, John. Right, so a couple of questions from the audience on Staph aureus. Um, so a question about the availability of phage therapy for Staph, um, Staph aureus, and what about multiple site bone joint infections with the same organism? I'm not sure who wants to take that first. Maybe it's Stephanie. Definitely. I was looking at John, but um, in terms of Staph aureus <laughs> in the lab at the moment, um, we currently only have two unique phages and there seems to be quite a like low diversity between staph aureus phages and we actually haven't had too many um, patients through the stamp that I've able to test our phages on but the ones that have um, at least one of them has worked so we've never taken a staph 
massage through to fruition um, through the stamp protocol, but I know John is probably itching to talk about the staff patients that were treated otherwise. Did you want to lead on from there, John? Yeah. So we, we have treated um, 14 people now with staph aureus phages, but all of those were obtained from uh, a US company called Armata, which is actually running a clinical trial in Australia, which is open at a couple of sites, including at Westmead, to look at the value of using this kind of therapy for bloodstream infections with the golden staph. So um, coming back to Steph's question, it is an interesting characteristic of the phages that we use to attack staph with, that they are relatively less diverse than the ones we see that we use to attack things like Pseudomonas or E. coli, and that's to do with their, their biology. But the short answer is yes, staph anti-staphylococcal phages uh, appear to be good. Um, they are available. They are even becoming commercially available. They are regarded as first cab off the rank, I think, the companies that are developing fast therapy. So another question for Tony. Um, so Tony, thinking about resource intensiveness um, from a pharmacy perspective, so uh, how would you describe the time and resources or requirements from a pharmacy perspective in terms of getting the product prepared? Uh, from my personal experience, it took about 10 hours of my time per week for one phage GMO, uh, one patient on GMO phages that we were um, making up doses for. And uh, I guess this could uh, help answer a, a later question, but um, this was for two patients who were, we were giving phages for uh, microbacterial infections, which were much longer durations of treatment. Um, I think um, both of them were about 12 months. Is that right, Armine? Yeah. So 12 months, 10 hours a week. Yeah. And Tony, it's John. That, that was because you had to reconstitute the phage, wasn't Correct. it? Yeah, yeah. So that's a little exceptional in that yeah. all the other phages we use are dispensed as single dose vials. So they just go straight to the hands of, of the nursing staff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And Steph, I'm going to come back to you with a science question again from Peter Middleton, um, who's asked that given the phages are released from the bacterium, example Pseudomonas, why is there a geographical limitation to the effect of the phage on the plates? So what would be the ramifications of delivery in the human subjects? I did read that question, but I wasn't actually sure how to answer that one. I didn't really understand. Um, I don't know, John, did you... Did, I, I, I'm not sure which question I'm hearing, whether we've got a question about the limitation of the burst size, Peter, which looks like a circle, and you wonder why it doesn't just keep going, because we've talked about a predator versus prey. And the brief answer to that is that basically the bacteria and the phages fight to a standstill, and that's normal biology. And maybe the other question perhaps you might have been asking was, why does it vary, ge vary geographically? And I guess the short answer to that is that it varies in the same way that the prey bacteria vary geographically. So the distribution of Pseudomonas subtypes, for example, um, can be defined um, in terms of their geographic mm. Yeah. Maybe, maybe if that was unsatisfactory, Peter, you might want to try and <laughs> raise the question in the chat if we missed, <laughs> missed your target. And a question for Amine with regards to duration or the courses of therapy. So there's actually a couple of questions that are somewhat related. So um, Grant Logan asks, what's the criteria by which you decide whether to deliver a single phage as therapy or a combination of different phages? Um, so that's one, I guess, more to do with um, the different types of phages. But then Alison Kakakios had asked, um, how do you work out the duration? So I think there was one mention of a presentation of phage therapy over, over weeks, whereas at another time it was mentioned over months. And so what do you uh, use to calibrate that? Sure. <clears throat> so um, remember, it was the first question was about oh, cocktails versus single. Yes, yeah. Right. So the first question, um, we're partly limited by what's available, right? So um, 
it, there's very few scenarios where we are told as clinicians, I've got 17 pages and they all look excellent. Um, you're limited by what is uh, both you know, therapeutically useful, but also is able to be purified to the standards that you need. We do occasionally get somewhere where we have two or three phages and we then use a cocktail because we do think that probably if you have multiple hits onto the same target, you're going to be more successful. One of the things that we do look at is the interactions between those because you can imagine that actually if you've got multiple things trying to attack the same thing, they can actually compete with each other or have some sort of negative interactions. And so we try and find, comb if there are combinations which are all individually look like they're good phages, we then test them in combination to make sure that that good combination remains good. Um, so that's how we decide about whether using one or two. When we're using one, it's basically because that's all we have. <laughs> um, they, you know, if we had more, we would use more probably. Um, but if we had tons, we would probably still limit ourselves to two or three at a time. And then you'd keep the others um, in reserve for in case there was neutralization or in case you need to do a second round of treatment or, or whatever. But generally, each time we just pick the best winners, those that look the best. In terms of the duration, we don't really know what the optimal duration of treatment is. And we sort of, and John touched on this a little bit. Um, we suspect that in most cases, you get the benefit in the first couple of weeks. And so, and we've documented that in patients that we've, you know, had really good outcome. It was clear after the first few weeks that that good outcome was established. In those patients that have gone on and on and on and on, we've continued because we weren't sure, but really we didn't get much more benefit. There wasn't sort of an accumulation of benefit over time. Um, and that's partly to do with, as John said, the biology of how the phages work, which is slightly different to how antibiotics work. Um, the ones we've treated for a long time have been the mycobacterial infections. And that's just been a hang up of how we use antibiotics, right? So mycobacterial infections traditionally have been treated for months, you know, usually up to about a year or so with antibiotics. And so when we started to add in phage therapy into this, we sort of modeled that and said, you know, if we're going to continue treating these patients for 12 months, we will continue giving them the phages for 12 months. Um, I'm not sure that that's necessary or, or warranted. And so that's one of the things that we're going to try and look at over time as we try and treat, um, treat more patients. For the standard bacteria, so whether it's a gram positive like Staph aureus or a gram negative like Pseudomonas, our, our standard treatment is two weeks because I think beyond that, there's not much evidence that you do more good with more treatment. Thank you. Thanks, Amine. Um, I've got a question that I'm going to put to Tony first, um, which is um, about the excretion of phages in bodily fluids. And um, so prefaced by a naive query by a surgeon, um, but I think it's a very important question. Um, do phages get excreted in bodily fluids? Um, and maybe follow on to that might be how do we manage waste if they do? You could throw uh, over to someone else if you want. to tap out and <laughs> reach out to Amine, but... All I can say is that the phage kinetics is very poorly described. Um, this is definitely an area of research, and I'm sure John wants someone to, to fill the gaps in because it doesn't follow typical absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion pathways of pharmacotherapy. It's, it's, it's what's been, uh, I guess, crudely described as predator-prey relationships where your prey is, you know, the bacteria or mycobacteria and the predator is the phage, which um, Armine has described quite well in one of her case reports with, with a beautiful curve of um, quantitative um, counts of pseudomonas in relation to quantitative counts of, um, of phage over, over a period of days um, from you know, 14 days of um, IV treatment. But in terms of um, the bodily fluids, uh, because it is a, a virus, I would presume it, it would permeate through all excretion pathways. Um, but happy for uh, Amine and, and John to chime in. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically true. Um, so we think that the viruses do get to a lot of places, most places, um, but they are limited by needing their host. And so if you don't have the bacteria in your urine or in your, you know, in your 
bowels, then they're probably not going to replicate there and stay there for very long. They do get cleared from the, the body very quickly, um, primarily through the reticular endothelial system, innate and immune responses. Um, and so where they persist is where they have their prey, so the, the bacterial hosts. Um, we are looking for them to try and sort of, as uh, Tony said, like fill in some of those knowledge gaps in terms of doing the kinetics and the different bodily fluids. Primarily, we're looking in, in the blood, um, but we are, you know, looking for it in the urine, in the poo, in, in the, the sputum um, to try and understand where they get to in terms of both tissue penetration, bioavailability, because none of this is actually described very well and we don't really know. Thank you. Um, I might pass this question on to Rachel. So, what are some of the things that you consider in terms of thinking about whether the patient can have um, therapy at home? So um, what are some of the things that need to be in place or considerations? I think in terms of coming to hospital in the home, the patient just needs to be clinically stable and has started the therapy in an inpatient setting. And then once the team is happy, um, and the, in talking about children, once a family are happy to take the child home, we can definitely, especially because it's long treatment, we're talking, you know, six, 12 months, it's quite a long time. So if we, for better quality of life, if we can do the treatment at home, we're going to do that as quickly as possible and as safe, safely as possible as well. So whether that means two weeks is an inpatient, it depends. I suppose m &A can comment on the inpatient setting and then when the transition happens. Um, but it's more likely to occur at home for the longer period. And uh, we'd like to get the child back at school as well um, when able to. Thank you. Thank you. Steph, I'm coming to you with the next one, which is from Anthony Kuzic, um, who I think still probably still over in WA, um, but has a question about for the bacterial isolates that didn't get a hit in your current repository, oh. how much more time was added to the process in identifying or sourcing a phage that was effective? It's a really good question. Um, I mean, as I showed on the screen, there's been times where we don't have a hit um, and we haven't gone any further, but there was one case where we didn't get a hit in our current collection and we did send it to national um, collaborators. And it does add a fair bit of time to the um, and resources to, you know, coordinating the, to send the isolate, um, obviously costs in shipping and then ensuring that the people that we send it to are using similar methods, because obviously if we're reporting to clinicians, the methods and the results that we're getting out of it. Um, so it's definitely something that we want to evolve, especially because we have the Farge Australia network. Um, and then obviously that means access to many other Farge collections that we don't have. Um, but yes, it does. It, from my perspective, from the lab um, alone, is it does add um, a fair bit of time, but something that we, you know, obviously in the right case wouldn't be um, opposed to, obviously. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else wants to add on that of the well, time just, allocations on the clinical just, side. Just to add, I guess, Steph, that um, at the moment, most of these collections are in research laboratories. And one of the things we're trying to do with people like Anthony, who asked the question, and equally colleagues in in Melbourne and in Adelaide is to actually move from the sort of research quality collection to the therapeutic quality collection, which is um, a much uh, higher level of purity and much more stringent, I think. So um, it does need to move away from the traditional research biobanks, which is where the big repositories are all around the world, into the more therapeutic biobanking concept, which is a lot more rigorous. Um, that first case that Tony referred to, which was Amanez, um, little girl who's treated with pseudomonas. That was sourced in Israel, purified in New York and treated in Sydney. And I think it was six weeks from go to woe, wasn't it, Amanez? Yep. Mm. Yeah, it was incredible, yeah. That was from when we first requested the phage um, to when we were able to first treat treatment. the patient. So it took us about six yeah. weeks. Um, yeah. But, the, you know, the, the other you know, example was the second patient we treated, which um, was unfortunately a GMO phage and sort of interrupted by mm. COVID. And that one was nine months <laughs> um, between, you know, trying to get the phage and then getting it. So it can be variable and it just depends on the phage, what other regulatory requirements are required, yeah. where the supplier is, um, oh. whether they're a commercial entity or another research entity. Um, so we're, we're trying, as part of the pro protocol, we're trying to streamline a lot of those processes as much as possible. Um, and hopefully moving forward, the more patients we treat, the, the process will become quicker and, and easier. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I mean, I just, and another couple of questions have come in asking about efficacy in mycobacteria. Um, I know you spoke a bit about that before in terms of the way you design the therapy uh, duration, but um, would you be able to comment on efficacy in mycobacteria? Um, so efficacy is generally an outstanding question in phage therapy. So we're all very comfortable about the safety of phages. Um, they're pretty safe, but well tolerated. Efficacy is an outstanding question. And, and part of the problem is that the, the actual therapeutically useful phages we're limited in at the moment. There's a bottleneck in terms of getting good phages, but also in terms of the, the types of patients we're treating. So we're treating patients where we're desperate. You know, they've gone through all sorts of treatments and they have very sort of complicated underlying um, uh, illnesses. And so, you know, the, the, the outcomes have been variable. So if we just think about the four patients with mycobacterial um, uh, infections that we've treated, um, oh no, uh, three patients, sorry, three patients. Um, one patient had an excellent outcome. We would consider her cured. <laughs> Um, one patient, we were able to demonstrate stabilization, but not cure. And the third patient, maybe stabilization, maybe no response. It was sort of difficult to determine at the end. Um, none of them had any harm. So safety was excellent. But in terms of efficacy, it's not clear. Um, Graham Hatfall and Pittsburgh have uh, supplied most of the phages that have been used therapeutically to us and also um, around the world. And, and they've sort of published their experience of treating 20 patients um, globally. And that's sort of the picture where about 50% have some improvement or some benefit, um, whether that's just stabilization or partial response or complete response. Um, and the other half, not much benefit. It's just teasing out trying to work out who you should be offering the treatment to, who is likely to benefit um, versus not, which is not very clear at the moment. I think Armin is making a really important point there. And that is that we're at the start of a therapy which is only being applied at the 11th hour. One minute to midnight, you call for phage therapy. And we all know that if you introduce the therapy at that stage, it's extremely unlikely to work whether it's an operation that you know works, an antibiotic that you know works, or something experimental at one minute to midnight, almost everything fails. And all phage therapy is applied at one minute to midnight, unfortunately. So it's very difficult to get these efficacy signals and they will probably only emerge from controlled trials, which are very expensive, but which are just beginning. Thanks, John. Um, we've got one time for one more question, Laura. I'll choose now. I'll, I'll think I might finish with this one. It's a bit more of a, maybe a bit of the story of how do we get to where we are. Um, so it's an anonymous attendee has said, it's a, this is an amazing demonstration of the translational capability um, at the hospitals um, and wants to know a bit about how the collaboration originated um, and also how did phage therapies come to be a viable option for treatment? You're the founding father, John, would you like to? <laughs> well, um... I think most of most infectious diseases physicians nowadays are faced with infections that are that are failing and they're casting around for something else other than antibiotics. And I was certainly in that position in 2007, and that's how I came across it. But this is a hundred year old story, because it arrived in the pre regulatory era. It has been normalised in the absence of all the kind of data that we would normally require to normalise a therapy in the modern era. And so we're still playing catch up with all that kind of stuff, you know, the controlled trials, all the kind of questions that we've been asked today. So what we did in Australia was um, people like, well, many of the people who I think are probably on this call, but certainly including Armini and I and others, gathered together as a group of physicians and scientists around the country and said, let's at least try and do this in a way that is most informative and safest and do it as an agreed network and try and devise some standardised protocols, which of course Amne um, has, has championed and that's uh, the stamp protocols one we use. Now that is not, we're not trying to say that this is the way to do phage therapy. We are simply saying that, look, we got all the best heads together. We developed a bit of a consensus position. We're going to measure everything we can find. And we're going to revise this protocol as soon as we get enough information to inform us how to, how to do that. And all of these conversations are having are being had with the regulators 
and with our colleagues around the country. And I think we're trying to encourage, we really do now have a very international network. Um, and so these conversations are now happening on the international stage, and we will continue to try and promote this global collaborative project and build information for the regulators so that we can develop a framework that works for us and works for health consumers. Thank you, John. That I think was a, a fantastic way to wrap up our webinar today. Um, and unfortunately, I can see there are still questions, but we have run out of time. So I just really wanted to thank everyone for their participation today um, and certainly um, to extend my absolute thanks to all the speakers today for their time. We will provide a video of the webinar, which will be available via our website at the Sydney Children's Hospitals Network YouTube channel. And there'll also be a short survey at the end. So if you have a moment, please fill it out because we really appreciate the feedback um, and suggestions for, for future webinars. Um, so I, I also wanted to thank both Laura and Michelle for facilitating today. I'd like to thank our contributors, including Luminous Alliance, and importantly, um, to all of you in the audience. It was really great to have such fantastic um, participation. Um, and again, the, the staff who have coordinated the webinar today and, and absolutely to our speakers. Um, and please stay tuned for our next webinar, which will be held in July, and that's going to be on genomic newborn screening. So we really look forward to having you join us um, again at um, that opportunity. So have a fantastic day, everyone, and thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.